it's finally race week and this time round one will be taking place in Bahrain. Welcome to the fourth episode of Formula Talk and we're here to preview the Bahrain Grand Prix for F2 and F3 and also discuss about F1 Academy. My name is Sophia and joining with me is the lovely Tom Downey. Hello. Hello. I'm not sure about lovely but hello. (laughs) How are you? Not too bad my friend. How are you? can't complain can't complain it's race week i uh, literally can't complain I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> so excited but first if you enjoyed this podcast we would love it if you would take five to leave us a five-star rating on spotify or a five-star review on P- apple Podcasts. and if you're one of the 72 percent of people who have not yet subscribed to the channel please consider helping us out with a like subscribe and share so let's get into it we're going to kick it off with f3 and we're going to discuss a little bit about the Bahrain circuit and discuss about the past winners and also give us kind of our predictions as well. It's a big different lineup compared to last season. Pretty much all the people that we're going to be mentioning aren't in F3 anymore. They're either in F2 or in some other discipline of racing now. So it's anybody's up for game kind of thing. So like Formula 1, F2 and F3 also does follow the same circuit in Bahrain. However, this the first time F3 actually raced was last season, and the circuit length is 5.412 kilometers. The fastest lap uh, was given to Franco Colapinto last uh, season with a 146.2, purely also because that was the first qualifying session ever at the track. But we'll discuss that a bit later about qualifying. In F2 and F3, there is the feature race and the sprint race. So for the sprint race, which takes place on the Saturday, that will be 20 laps. And for the feature race, that is 23 laps. Now, three laps might not sound like a big difference, but it it's all for game. Like, there's been so many changes towards the end, especially if we have any red flags or any collisions. Not that we don't want collisions, but there is p- potential with that many cars on the grid. Now, we're going to discuss the podiums as well. Most of these names will be not racing in F3 this season. A lot of them have moved to F2 or on to other motor disciplines. But first, let's discuss qualifying that took place last season. And here's Tom for it. Yes, thank you, Sophia. So last year, uh, we obviously had qualifying. You know, the the, uh, the grid's got to set itself somehow. And qualifying for F3 and also F2, which we'll get into in a bit, follows a slightly different format to to F1. So in F1, obviously, you have the three stages of knockout where you progress through each session. In F3, we have a half-hour window where all drivers will have half an hour to complete as many or as few laps as they please. Now, bear in mind that each driver will have to complete at least one outlap a hot lap, and then a cool down come in lap. Some drivers may even uh, perform two out laps, depending on you know if 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 you know if they feel ready or if they encounter traffic or something. So in in qualifying last year, taking pole position was Franco Colapinto for Van Amersfoort Racing, and as Sophia mentioned, he also set the track record time, which was a one forty six two. He also went through the speed trap at 183 kilometers an hour. Now, now being being a Brit, we use miles per hour, so I couldn't tell you what that is. Um, he also, this is a rule unique to F3 and F2 compared to F1. He also took a point for um, for getting pole position. So, if anybody ever says to you, "Oh, well, point," you know, um, you know, uh, points don't win Saturday or or, or whatever, tell them ab 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 ab. F3, you get a point for pole. So yes, you know, so 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 please, you know, so use that use that information wisely. So once the order is set in in qualifying, the top twelve actually get reversed for the sprint race. So although um, Franco Colapinto took pole in the qualifying session, it actually started the sprint race in P12, and that means that Zach O'Sullivan, who finished P12 in qualifying actually started the sprint race on pole, technically. So try and get your head around that one, folks. It's uh it's a bit it, it might seem a bit backwards, but it's also good to um it mixes up the grid a bit. And especially as it's a spec series, it sometimes does encourage good racing. Um although with some of the F3 drivers, they don't need any encouragement to go wheel to wheel, I think it's fair to say. Now you're probably thinking, well hang on a minute, Colapinto 
he was on pole. So is he going to start a race on pole or is he just going to get done over? No, 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 no. The um, the the main race, if you like, or the feature race, uh, that is the grid which has been set by qualifying. Even though Colapinto took pole, he still he still starts the feature race on pole. It's not it's not a case of he gets awarded pole position and then gets told that actually you can't do anything with it and you get put right in the midfield. It's it's not that. So pole position is still awarded. He goes down as a pole sitter. And that means that he starts the feature race early on a Sunday morning on pole position. And I'm going to hand you back to Sophia, where we're going to look at some bits around F2. And I'm going to hand you back to Sophia, where we're going to talk about the podiums. Thank you. So with the sprint, we're just going to bound off the podium. So as mentioned, Zach O'Sullivan was starting on pole, followed with Ollie Behrman. However, Zach O'Sullivan did not finish on podium. But it was Isaac Hajar, who will be racing in F2 this season, who took the top spot. Followed by him is Ollie Behrman, again, will be racing in F2 this season. And rounding up the podium is Alex Somalia with MP Motorsport. Now, he's not racing or confirmed racing for F2 and F3. We still have that one seat available for F3 that's still waiting to be confirmed for high tech, even as of today, February 28th two days before free practice starting. So who knows? <laughs> he might be on the grid. And then as mentioned, qualifying sets the grid for the feature race, which is 23 laps. And the winner of the feature race was the F3 world champion, Victor Martins. He took first place, followed by Arthur Leclerc. And then rounding up the podium with Gregor Salty. Now Gregor is back in F3 this season. And he actually did quite well in testing, taking some of the top positions in testing. Mind you, we can't take testing as it is. Look how it is in F1 as well. It's pretty much the same in F2 and F3. Sandbagging, testing out different discussions, especially in F3 where there's a lot of rookies. Some of the older drivers, I say older, they're only in like their 20s or like early, like late teens. But some of them that have had more experience in these cars probably would have finished a lot higher compared to some of the rookies. And Gregor is a great example. He's a great driver. But again, we don't know how it is for testing. Now, let's go for predictions. Because F3 will be very difficult compared to F2 for predictions. But I think my podium for feature, not for sprint, because we're basing off of how qualifying is because we won't know how the reverse grid is. But for feature, I think I'm going to go with Greg Wasasi, obviously to take um, first place. I think Gabriel Mini, one of the rookies who um, was the runner up in Freca last season. I think he will take P2. And then my last one. Let's go Oliver Guthrie, another rookie who was a Euro for Formula 2022 champion. I think that will be my podium for the first race of the season. What about you, Tom? That is quite an interesting podium. It's going to be very different from mine. And that's one of the things I do like about F3, actually, is, you know, it's, you know anybody can stand, on the, can stand on any of the steps. So I think my podium for P1, I think we're going to see Zach O'Sullivan. On the top step, you know, I, I think he, I think he's, he's he showed a bit he showed a bit last season, and you know he's he's not he's not an out and out rookie anymore, you know. So I I, I think he'll be one to keep an eye on. P two, I'm going to say last year's pole sitter, Colapinto. He goes quite well around here, as evidenced by pole position last year. Um, obviously, got to keep his nose clean. And then P three, I'm going to say. I'm actually going to say Golapinto's teammate, Johnny Edgar. I have faith. It might, be, it, it might be blind faith. It might be blind hope. Who knows? But that's I mean, what I'm going with. Johnny's a good driver as well. Obviously, he did take a little bit of time off um, during the season in 2022, but I think he's coming back better than ever. He was very quiet in testing, though, however, but again, can't take too much on it for testing. Yeah, so, you know... Uh, I'm I'm almost sort of like taking not taking solace, but sort of like taking a bit of you know taking a bit of impetus from the drivers who were quite quiet because they just 
pounded around. They just, you know, they just got the laps under their belt. You know, they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't do anything too sort of showy. They just got on with it. And I think in in a grid that's so tightly contested like F3, and with some rather shall we say, hot-headed drivers, because we do see that a lot, especially in the junior series. Um, you know, you know, I, I think if you know if if um if if Eka can just stay out of trouble effectively, it's like, you know, if people start squabbling and scrapping going into turn one, two, three at Bahrain, you know, that nice right left right at the start, he can just do what I do on FN22, just leave all the air, AI start scrapping to go dunk around the outside and and uh, and pick up some positions. Who knows, eh? Okay. What about bowl prediction? Do you want to go for those ones now? Following how grid talk is? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Okay. Sure so is. You go first. <laughs> my bold prediction, and this is a very bold prediction for F3, every single car that enters is going to finish. Okay, because that's totally different from mine because I'm saying how many DNFs there might be. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Very drastic in our <laughs> predictions. Okay, so you think there's going to be no DNFs at all? I didn't say I think. Your prediction. <laughs> yeah. You're predicting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. A lot of rookies on the grid, so <laughs> that's why I'm going with my one. Um, I think there's going to be four DNFs, but I don't think all of them are due to crashes. I think some of them will be like mechanical failures as well. I'm not obviously wanting crashes, but I do think with some of the rookies, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I am blasting on the rookies, but obviously we could have more experienced drivers as well doing the same thing. I think there might be some um, car problems for some of the teams. And so that's what I'm saying, four DNFs. I mean, that's quite low for, for, for F3. If we are going to get <laughs> DNFs, I think we're going to yeah. get probably about half the blinking grid. You know whether they overheat or, or you know, or whether they just pile into each other. But, uh, but yeah, e- either way, I'm just looking forward. I'm just looking forward to it. I'm so ready for the season. Like, yeah. I-, I say this all the time: F3 and F2 like make things more interesting than F1 on some of these races. Like, because there's so many cars, there's all buying to try to get into F1. They're willing to get their elbows out. They're willing to go p- past the limit, push the limit, overtake where it's possible, even overtaking where normally it has been possible in F1 cars. Obviously, these cars are a lot smaller as well and less so power than F1. So there is more opportunities for that. So I'm really excited. But let's go on to F2. Let's preview the uh, F2 barring one. Once again, same amount of circuit length, 5.412 kilometers. They've actually been racing every year in Bahrain since the inception back in 2017. Now, again, sprint race. Shorter amount, so there's only 23 laps, which is the same amount as the feature race in F3, but the feature race is actually 32. Now, that's a big difference as well. There's going to be a lot of changes in that last couple of laps. I know that for sure, because that's always been the case in every single round in F2. Those last couple of laps, especially if there's any issues or we have cautions, anything can change. The fastest lap actually dates back to 2017, and it is F1 Ferrari driver Charles Leclerc time with a 138.9. So, wow, like how much of a difference? That's quite a big difference from F3. That's at least, what, nine seconds difference? Almost, yeah, nearly 10 second difference. Yeah, nine, uh, eight seconds difference between the fastest lap in F3 to the fastest lap in F2. Wow, big change. <laughs> Yeah, that is a, that is quite the step up. Um, and bearing in mind, I do believe the F three cars had DRS as well last year because obviously they, they didn't used to when when, when the F two cars did for a while. Yeah, um, definitely. So, like how we did with F three, let's look at the qualifying. Now it's unlike F three, which is the top twelve. It's the top ten that's reversed. So this is following a little bit in Formula 1 when they do for the sprint. But again, your position in sprint does not determine your grid position for feature, which, again, I think is probably the best thing because the person that was awarded pole should get pole for the actual race. 
unlike how it is with F1, t- um, with the sprint races that are taking place in F1 this season and how we saw in last season. So the top, the top person is also returning to F2, and he's also the Alpine reserve driver of Jack Dewan. He had a fastest time of a 140, so not that far off from Charles, but still two seconds off. So he will start, start at the top on for the feature, but let's discuss about sprint because there's some big names into the sprint races and the podium from last season at Bahrain. So I'm going to pass it off to Tom. Yes, thank you, Sophia. Let's have a quick look at the sprint results from last year. So it was Felipe Drogovic who was on pole uh, for the sprint. However, he finished the race in P5. So, you know, perhaps not the, perhaps not the start he was looking for. And the race was won by the man who started P2, and that was Richard Vershaw. And joining him on the podium last season, a name which we heard quite a lot about, was Jehan Zaruvula of Prema Racing, obviously back this season. And joining him is a fellow Red Bull alumni, or certainly they certainly were at the time, I believe they, I believe he still is, Liam Lawson of Carlin, who, yes, of course he's Red Bull alumni because he was doing a hill climb in Australia and one of, one of the V8 Red Bulls a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, so that, that, was, that was your top three. Um, as I mentioned, Drogovic was P5. Some of, the notable, some of the notable names, I'll just round out the top 10 quickly. So we had Ralph Boschong of Campos in, um, in P4. Uh, we had the latest Williams driver in F1, Logan Sargent. He was P6 in, uh, in, in the Carlin. Uh, we had the resident Twitch streamer, Yuri Vips, in P7. Sophia's looking at me because she's thinking, what on earth are you going to say? I'm not going to say anything. Um you know, Yuri Vips, who was former Red Bull alumni before he was unceremoniously dumped, and everybody knows why. Um, we have yet another Red Bull alumni driver in Amuyu Iwasa, who was racing for Dams. And then rounding out the top 10, we had Dennis Hauger in P9 and Jack Doohan in P10. So Doohan finished where he started, which in F2 is actually a lot more of an achievement than you think it is because everybody seems hell-bent on driving into each other. Now we'll pass it back to Sophia, where we'll have a quick look at the feature race. Yeah, definitely. I mean, how we're going to discuss the feature race is very different to where the lineup was for the qualifying. So as mentioned, Jack Doom was starting on pole, followed by Tara Porcher, who would be on the front row with him, and then Yuri Vips and Logan Sargent for the top two rows. However, in the feature race, bit of a change um and it was actually Teo Porcher who topped the podium followed by Liam Larson and then Yuri Vips to round out the podium now Teo is actually returning to F2 and he actually had a great testing season as well he finished I think three out of the six sessions at the top of the leaderboard so definitely a driver to look out for in this new season I'll finish off with the top 10. Then we have Ralph Boschop finishing P4. Marcus Armstrong, a name that we've not heard for a while, who's going to be racing in IndyCar um, this season, finishing P5. The F2 uh, world champion, um, Felipe Djokovic, finishing P6, followed by the F1 Williams driver, Logan Sargent, in P7. Roy Nassani in P8. And then Jake Hughes, who is racing in... Formula E for McLaren, P9. And then Jack Dewan, who started on pole, finishing 10. Again, quite similar to how it was in the sprint, finishing in 10th again. However, he finished where he started in the sprint, not so much in the feature. But that's the preview for the F2 and F3 for Bahrain. It all starts on Friday, where we have both free practice sessions, just one session each. And then we both have a qualifying session of 30 minutes on the Friday as well. Saturday, early start for those that live in the UK to watch the race for the sprint races, because they are normally done before or in between. Yeah, done, um, I think, before the free practice for Formula One. God, I double check my times on that. And then the feature race as well, another early morning. I think it's probably about 7 a.m. UK time. So make sure you have your coffee ready for that if you are to watch it. I definitely will be. 
Yeah, and um, it's it's going to be quite an early start for uh, you know if 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 you do want to watch the um the, the junior series, do think of it as good practice for the flyaway races like Japan and Australia, um, you know because those are uh, those are obviously if you're UK or you know Europe based like uh like uh, like like some of us, it uh, can be an early start, but it's a good it's also a good chance for those of those of you know those of our fellow. F- F1 Chronicle members who uh, who who live in other time zones, and when we complain about two races a year, they get twenty races a year. So yes, let's. Uh, so should we have quite a some predictions for F2? Oh, why not? Let's. I feel Go like this then. is going to be even more because it's so harder. I think because there's so many great drivers. I mean, F3 has great drivers as well. I think for podium. Hmm, I think taking P1 will be Teo Porcher. Okay. I think just because I'm always going to back this person up because I am a huge fan of them. And if they are listening, hi, big fan. I think Zane Maloney will take P2. And then for P3, oh, this is going to be hard. <laughs> um, hmm. It's know. wide open for F2, isn't it? It's so many. Like, just looking at these names, it's just like, Oh my god, I can't even choose. I uh, I think Jack Dewan. Let's go cuz he did he did have a good season last season, obviously finishing on in the points for both feature and sprint and taking pole in the qualifying. Yep. So Teo, Zane, Jack. That's my top 3. You do surprise me. Be you, you know, but what what you know, I wouldn't expect anything less. You're going to back your fellow Bermuda driver. I mean, he's from Barbados. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. You do this I every time. Re- I, I, you do, do, do you know what? Time. I thought I was right then. I really thought I was Bermuda, right. Bermuda, Bahamas, Barbados, Barbuda. We all, uh, they all, we all get confused. I understand. I do get it all the time. Don't even, don't even add Barbuda into this because I'm just going to get you even more confused. Never mind our, never mind our poor listeners. But um, but yeah, okay. But either way, you know, I, I, I know, I know, you know, you, you, you've, you've got, a, you've got a big soft spot for him. But um, my podium, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree with P1. I think it would be Taylor Proche. He showed quite a lot last season, and I think now that now that he's already had a year in F2, you know, we sort of. He sort of bedded in a bit more. Um, you know, he I would say would understand isn't the right word, but he's more familiar with the cars and he's more familiar with you know the additional efforts if you like required, you know, obviously the physical sort of force or physical impact it has as a driver. Um for P2, I am going to say a name who cropped up a fair bit last year. I'm gonna say Johan de Ruvela, P2. Because he, you know, because he won a couple of races last year, he was fairly quick and he was in the title fight. And P three, going to go a little bit left field. I'm going to say Frederick Vesti. Mercedes are backed him for a reason. So, okay. And a bold prediction. Uh, Roy Nassani doesn't bin it. He's got a new team anyway. <laughs> I know. Well, he's he's basically he's basically like playing bingo with all the teams to see all the all the teams he can drive for. Or the Infinity he, Stones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's with PHM Racing by Shrew, so obviously that's a new ish, new ish team um, taking over from Shrews from previous seasons. We'll see. Yeah, but it's Hassani. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. For our listeners, that's all you need to know. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, I think all the rookies will get points in the future. So that yeah. is Arthur Leclerc, Isaac Hajar, Jack Crawford, Ollie Behrman, Victor Martins, and Zay Maloney, and Brad Benavides. And Roman Stanek and one well, I can't really say is one well career a rookie. I mean he has been in F3. I wouldn't consider him a rookie. I wouldn't, though. yeah. Um, and then also uh Cushman Manny as well. So to be fair, I feel like my podium has been absolutely wrecked now with the amount of rookies I'm saying. Maybe I'm gonna backtrack. I'm gonna say half of the rookies 
will get points in the feature race. So it's only 10 sport- <laughs> spots and there's like, I think, n- nine rookies that are on the grid this season. So I was, I was going to say, I, I, th- I, think, I, think, I think you're running out of positions. Yeah. So five, five of the rookies will get points. I'm not okay. saying which ones though. But obviously Zane will because I want him to be on podium. <laughs> oh, of course, God. of course. Got it back. Got it back to the islands. Have to. Yeah. All the ones beginning with B. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So F1 Academy. We've not spoken about this much because information has just been coming out like crazy about this. But we do have more information. We have some drivers uh, confirmed now as well. So we're just going to explain for the last bit of this podcast what the F1 Academy is, how the structure of the racing is going to be like, who the teams, the calendar, and some of the drivers confirmed. And also discuss about the difference between F1 Academy and W Series as well, because there's a lot to discuss about this new uh, pilot program that is meant to feed from F1 F1 Academy to F3, to F2, to F1. So it's a fourth step. I guess it's on par with Formula 4, but they don't really say it is. But it is quite equal, I'm assuming. Yeah, so the the, the, the car spec and the sort of estimated speeds, if you like, they all sit around the same. They sit sort of like alongside, um, yeah, alongside uh, Formula 4. So um, yeah, so, so you, you yeah you are sort of you, you're you're in the right area, but if we just have a quick look at the calendar for the F1 Academy, so it will feature seven different circuits. Now there are multiple races at each circuit, uh, which we'll go into in more detail in in a moment. But the season kicks off on the weekend of the twenty eighth of April, so we still have well two months to the day of recording. Um, where the first the first weekend of racing will be at one of my favourite circuits on the track. It's not Monaco, quite the opposite. Um, it is the Red Bull Ring, Spielberg in Austria. So we have the weekend of the 28th to the 29th there. We then have the second weekend, or round two, if you like, taking place at the Valencia, not the street circuit, which has been abandoned, but, but um, Valencia... Uh, the permanent circuit, I believe, is called v- uh, Valencia Motorsport Park. I can't remember the exact name. Um, that's on that's on the weekend of the fifth to the seventh of May. Following that, we have the weekend of the of the nineteenth to the twenty first of May. Again in Spain, this time at Circuit de Catalunya in Barcelona. Now, just very quickly um, on the topic of Barcelona, obviously F one have announced that they are removing the final chicane. So from 2023 onwards, F1 will run, will cut out that horrible last chicane at Barcelona and they will just run their lovely double right-hander. On the track map that's on the graphic for F1 Academy, that has the uh, the chicane in the final sector in it. I wonder, and I'm just really speculating, if F1 Academy will run without that final chicane. We don't know yet. We don't have any information. That's something I've just picked up on looking at this looking at this this image, this image was probably generated quite a while before F1 said they were going to be removing that last chicane. So who knows? I'm just speculating. But moving on from that, um, we have on the weekend of the 23rd to the 25th of June, uh, we uh, we go to Zanvoort where it is just full of orange smoke. Um, so that will be that will be interesting. Um, then. On the weekend of the seventh to the 9th of July, we are at Monza. Uh, you know, obviously everybody knows Monza. That's that's going to be exciting. Um, the penultimate round, then the last weekend of July, the 29th to the 30th, of the 29th to the thirtieth, I should say, we are at Le Castellet, aka Circuit Paul Ricard. Uh, we do have the chicane in the middle of the straight, so it's not just hell for leather all the way down, but it is the full F1 layout. And then last but by no means least, and I would say my second favourite circuit on this list, um, it is on the F1 weekend, uh, and we are at Circuit of the Americas in Austin. So that is the 20th to the 22nd of October. So the season runs from the last weekend of April to the 
one of the middle weekends of October. There is no racing uh, from the last weekend of July, so there is quite an extended break in between round six and round seven. Um, the championship may be wrapped up by then. We don't know. So, um, you know, it, it could be all could be all to play for. But I would just push it back to Sophia quickly where we'll have a look through the weekend format. Yeah, so we finally have information. As Tom has mentioned, there's some weekends where it's Friday to Sunday, and then we have some weekends where it's only Saturday and Sunday. So how the sessions will go is... There's two free practices, um, both 40 minutes, and then following that, we'll go into qualifying session one, which is 15 minutes. That qualifying session will go into the race one and race two. Race one is 30 minutes plus one laps, so W Series format. They don't do um, by the amount of laps. I feel that that shouldn't happen because of red flags and cautions. It should be just the total amount of laps, but anyway. Race two will be 20 minutes plus one lap. And then qualifying session two, another 15-minute qualifying that will take place on the second day of racing. And then race three, which will be 30 minutes and one lap. Now, there is points awarded for qualifying, like how F2 and F3 are. In both qualifying sessions, two points will be awarded for pole position. How the grid is determined by qualifying is... Race one, the grid will be set by the fastest qualifying results, so as it stands. However, in race two, which is the short amount of time, it is the top eight that will be reversed for race two. Race three, it will be the grid set by the second qualifying results, so the second qualifying session on the second day. Points allocation. Oh my god, this is crazy to wrap my head around. (laughs) So... In race one and race three, they follow the same amount, and it is F1 style points, 25 for the winner, all the way down to P10 for one point. However, race two is a bit shorter, where it's only the top eight that get points, with a uh, person that plays it first will get 10 points, followed by eight, six, five, four, three, two, all the way to eighth, which gets one. Every single race, the fastest lap will also get one point. So Lots of points on hand for this. So uh, I feel like it's going to be very changing around to see who's going to win um, for the F1 Academy. Now, comparing it to W Series, I mean, going back to the calendar, almost every single round is the same time as an F1 race and an F2 and F3. That, ha- I think there's only one, I think it's Monza, is the only time, oh no, no, it's not Monza. There's one race where there's no F1 on at all. But all the other ones have something on. I think Miami overlaps, Baku overlaps with these. And obviously Miami, we don't have F2 and F3, but obviously Baku, we do have F2. And obviously we have the sprints of F1. There's not, I hope that we will still get some screen time of these races, even though they're not in the F1 format. But I feel like they could have just timed it a lot better as well because the teams that are taking place in F1 Academy, Carling, High Tech, ART, these MP, these teams, and Prema as well, these teams are in F2 and F3, so you don't want them the same weekends of F2 and F3 as well, especially if staffing is going to be the same. I don't know. What do you think, Tom? I think he's... uh... It's it's a bit of a not mistake because motorsport does obviously sit in sit in a certain window. Um, I just think it's a shame for the drivers involved in um, in W Series. And I know we were talking about this off air a couple of weeks ago, um, even before the schedules were announced properly. Um, it's a really good opportunity for the FIA and Formula One management and everybody else involved to really promote women in motorsport. And I don't want to make this about women in motorsport. I want to make this about getting exposure for the series because obviously a lot of people watch F1 um, and you know we have social media and Liberty Media and Drive to Survive and all those kind of things to thank for that. But we don't see enough of the junior series and especially things like, you know, WC was folded because it didn't have enough money and, you know, didn't have enough input from the FIA and, you know, didn't have enough backing, all, all, all the rest of it. 
and um, and you know, occasionally you'll hear people ask, you know, oh, how come we haven't got any females, you know, driving in F one or, or you know, you know, are there any females, you know, in in F two or F three or you know, or, or you know, you know, people won't even know the junior shoes. I'll just ask about. They'll just ask about the you know the sort of like reserve teams or you know they they'll be meaning they'll be meaning the the support teams or or the sort of junior teams. F1 Academy is really going to be battling for airtime, and if you look at the times when the races are on, if you look at an F1 weekend, you have all the stuff at F3 which we just talked about. You have all the stuff at F2 which we just talked about. And you have F1. Now, notwithstanding incidents, accidents, track repairs, red flags, rain, you know, Silverstone, come on, it's always going to rain at some point. Um, you know, and as harsh as it may seem, ultimately every series gets shuffled along or has its race time shortened or its practice time shortened to make way for F1 because F1 is one that brings the most money into a weekend. And in an already contested scheduling um, sort of, not conflicts, but but in in a very already uh, contested scheduling sort of plan, where does F1 Academy fit into that? Because all you have to do is look at, Plan of you know on, on Sky for example. If I went downstairs and looked at my Sky box now, from Thursday onwards, it will just be full of you know Thursday will just be full of press conferences and build up. Friday will have all the practice you know we'll have F one practice sessions. We'll have quality and practice for F two and F three and you know it, it, it's just there's no room for F one Academy on Sky. So where's it going to go? Because Sky hold the rights to so much stuff in the UK, and I just fear that it's going to get lost. I think the Cota round is going to bring some great exposure because it's there with the F1 circus. It's there. It's it's ingrained, and a circuit like Cota has the space. It has the space to host multiple support series, but not all circuits do. And I'm just concerned that it's not going to paint um, the picture that we deserve to see of F1 Academy and the drivers deserve more. Definitely. I mean, we have seven drivers confirmed so far at the time of this recording on the 28th of February and some of them are all ex uh, WCH drivers. Some of them are also F4 and regional um, drivers as well. We know obviously the first season will be a little bit of sorting out headaches and all that kind of stuff um i do understand that i just feel like the choice of these tracks could have been better um and how the structure is doing the time lapse we saw in w series last season and even previous seasons where when it's timed we have big crashes like what happened in spa what happened in miami where it took our majority of the race time and it left the drivers pretty much only doing maybe about five laps of the entire race in the 30 minute window like it's not ideal and again the fact that it overlaps with other races other f1 races and support series racing it's going to be five for screen time and i know that they can't always be with f1 and everything but there's some big breaks that are taking place in f1 like after round three time it then during the off season time it maybe then i i don't know obviously we have taken account staff and their time off and everything as well but just to time it a bit better or timing it with the timings as well. If it's a flyaway like Japan, maybe do something in Europe so that you can have multiple racing throughout the day with people having the right exposure. But we'll see. We'll discuss about the drivers in another episode um, once the full grid is confirmed. As mentioned, there's 15 spots available for this series. Um, five teams, three drivers each. At the moment, we only have seven confirmed. So once the full grid is done, We'll give you a bit of a rundown because there are some names that even I don't recognize as well. I'll probably have to do a bit of research in, but some of them um, off the top of my head, Bianca Bustamante, WCH driver, um, Formula Regional Middle East and Formula Region uh, Asian driver as well. So 
that's one name. Obviously, we won't see Jamie Chadwick as she is racing in IndyCar Next, which is the feeder series into IndyCar. Um, different kind of topic and situation about that. But, yeah, that's... I'm so ready for this season. I can't wait. It's going to be a great season. Um, even in the off seasons, we'll still be running our weekly podcast. So make sure you like, subscribe, share, and follow and be notified of any episodes that drop. So Before My Talk is available on YouTube where soon episodes will be recorded live. At the moment, this is pre-recorded. But you can find all our videos on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, and Pocket Cast. Just search Formula One Grid Talk, which is the main podcast series that we run. This is our support one. And you can find the back catalog of all the shows, which has previews and reactions to qualifying and race results. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get mics, lights, and better recording equipment. And also make sure you subscribe so you're the first one to know when each new weekly episode is released. We'll be back soon with plenty more F2 and F3 content now that the season started. So excited. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tom, for joining me again. Well, thank you. Pleasure as always, Sam. And that's goodbye for me as well. So bye. Bye bye.